Hey, this is George. Hey, this is Frags. This is Real Talk with George and Fraser. Fraser, what's going on, brother? Not much, man. Not much. Just chilling. Another day, another day of paradise. Oh, man, look. You know, it's just, it's almost to the point, brother, where I don't even want to pick up my cell phone because it's like, geez, Louise, what's going to happen today? You know, <laughs> at what was it? At four o'clock, the FBI hit you the warning that they're going to be marching on all the state capitals, armed marches now. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Completely crazy. That's but crazy. That's that, we have a great show today, Mr. Andy. Oh, yeah. Comedian. This show today. Our, our actually first comedian on the show. We've had a lot of music artists. We've had some politicians. We have a lot of things. But our first comedian is with us. Andy, part of the beer game. Representing uh -oh. represent uh -oh. the beer game, baby. Here he is. <laughs> yeah, Andy, so welcome to Real Talk. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, My beer I've been working today. It's a little messed up. It's a little, I needed to clean it up a bit better. But yeah, what you get today? Definitely good, good, good. good. Definitely all good. So tell the fans a little bit about your bio. Um, I say this every time. Fraser and I try to do somebody's description or bio. We butcher it. So just just a little bit. Just a just little. A little bit. bit. You know. So tell the fans a little bit about you. I I, uh, I was a dad. That's really what I was, and I wanted to. Uh, I was. Working basically just to pay for my kids' school, uh, food, house. And uh, so I was working um, all kinds of different jobs. And I always had like love for comedy. So I started doing it. And uh, I started figuring out a way to get to do comedy. So at, at 42, I started doing comedy, taking it seriously. Got a job serving so I could work, do comedy at night every night. And uh, I did that for about eight years. And then I had Aries, Aries Spears. Um, and I, I was working pretty regular before, but only in Arizona and in areas all over the country. So, um, you know, I've been with him for a little bit and things have been going well. Nice. Nice. That, that, that's, that's my whole bio. It's not much. <laughs> uh, but I've been all over the country and I've been doing it seriously for, with Aries for years now. And it's, uh, it's unique. I'm having a unique experience because, uh, uh, my background, my history is I'm Mexican and Jewish, and uh, I'm touring with uh, Aries, who is a black man. And uh, I do a lot of I do rooms that most white comics would never get to go to. Right. I, white looking comics would never get to go to. So it's been very interesting. Uh, uh, it's been it's been these last three years have been really interesting. It really an experience that uh, unlike most no other comic is going to get. So I'm enjoying myself. Nice. Now, are you just touring? Are you writing? I mean, can we? Are we going to see you in a special soon on Netflix? I mean, what are the plans? <laughs> oh, uh, I think you know, I, and I'm, I might be using this as an excuse or a crutch, but um, I, uh, I, I mean, starting off as old as I did, I mean, the business, uh, the business, I, I believe, likes younger people for the most part. There are some when you're older, you can't break into the business. I, I'm so. I'm not using it as an excuse. I'm just saying odds are. Right. So it's very rare that someone uh, older breaks into the business. I mean, uh, I think you could name them on one hand. Uh, the only one that I know that's older that really got into comedy later uh, is uh, the guy in known, more known, is Eddie Pepitone, who's out of New York. And you guys, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. So that, mm -hmm. that okay. So he's, he's one. Uh, obviously, uh, fam the most famous one is. Uh, I always have problems with remembering names, even comics names. Uh, let's see, I can't get no respect guy. Uh, Ronnie Dangerfield. Ronnie Dangerfield. Yeah, come here, Ronnie Dangerfield. Yeah. So, uh, and then there's a, another guy who's my same age. His name's Dean Del Rey, and he's out of uh, L.A. Uh, I think he might be in New York now, but uh, he's done, you know, he's doing all right. He's he's probably a little ahead of where I'm at right now. But uh, I'm going to release my own special if we ever get out of uh, this Corona thing and we get audiences to come back to the clubs. I would like to release the material I've been doing for the last few years, kind of in a way to make me do new material, force me to get in and write new material, work on a new set. And uh, just because some of it I'm just tired of doing. Right. Nice. Quick, Frank. Oh, so I'm going to aid. I'm gonna say, hey, I can't do comedy for nothing. I'm funny some of the time, just not all the time. <laughs> no one's funny all the time. <laughs> Most comedians are not funny at all when they're not on stage. They're they're pacing themselves. 
<laughs> that is true. I heard that though. I've heard that so. So, so let me ask you a question. So how hard has it been that like, your challenge has been an older comedian versus like some of the young comedians that's getting jobs or as you get in, in this club's bookings and stuff? Well, uh, there's advantages for, for me being older only in that uh, I'm, I'm, the maturing level that I have is different. So instead of uh, uh, some, when you're younger and life is going well, sometimes you can, uh, you can make your own problems. You know, you can, you can ask for a lot. Maybe you can drink a lot. Uh, when you go to the clubs, maybe you try to sleep with all the, the, the cocktail waitresses. I mean, you just you can create some of your own problems. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm older. I'm in a, a solid long term relationship. So I'm not trying to bang host uh, waitresses and, you know, hostesses. Uh, uh, I, I, I drink a little bit, but not a lot. I mean, I have a drink or two in a night. I know more than that because I just wanna, I want to I want to wake up the next morning and go do something, not stay at home and nursing a headache all day. Right. Uh, so those kind of things, are, it's good to be older. Uh, Aries was also been doing this for 30 years, and Aries is 10 years younger than me. He's 45. I think of myself as a spry 55-year-old. So uh, it hasn't – being on the road is still uh, – I like relating to the, uh, uh, to the audience, uh, I'm, I talk about a lot of things that affects a lot of people. So I, I think I'm relating to the audience on that level. I'm not talking about um, things that are real – like real old comics talk about. Uh, I, I, bear, I, I mentioned my prostate once, but that's about it. But <laughs> even when I tell that joke, I tie it into being youthful. And uh, so uh, I, I think uh, my girls, young me and me, like I said, I raised two boys. And uh, that whole, that, that group was the center of my life for so long. They kept me younger. Right. So uh, that I, that's why I think I can still relate to audiences. And uh, that, that that makes that, that makes it easier for me. I think even as an older guy, I, I think I'm the youngness in my heart comes out. Uh, but but the experience I think shows. I, I think makes me not necessarily a better comic, an easier person to deal with on the road. Right. So what that, were some of your comedic influences? Richard Pryor. Uh, yeah. I mean. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm I'm kind of done right there. I mean, he's. You know what? Um, I have a lot of comedy influences. I mean, even guys that I came up with that no one knows about that maybe even to I mean, everybody influences you with their style, what you think is you know funny about them, their witisms, how, however they affect you. But uh, Richard Pryor for me, like that was the bar. He set the bar, and everything else was was that. The only thing is now uh, with Chappelle, Dave Chappelle. I think since Pryor, he's the first one that I think is figuring out a way to make this one more level. He's figuring out a way to make, take that next step that I don't think really anybody's done. Um, I really, I really enjoy watching him and his uh, uh, still being who he was like prior, but being yeah. able to be political, be political savvy, uh, not lose you and still be funny. I, I think he's the next level. So those two would be the only guys that I would say are my influences, but I'm influenced by everyone. Right. Well, you know what, Chappelle, what he's been able to do is be able to add just a little bit more um, morality. And I don't want to say political consciousness because it's like David Chappelle has a way of saying, aha, or I got you in his comedy, so <laughs> to speak. You know, I remember watching one of his Netflix specials when he was talking about um, the heroin epidemic, and he was like, now you guys know how we feel. Just say no. You know, and I died laughing at that, but I was laughing at the fact that what he was saying was absolutely so true. You know what I mean? When it comes to the visual aid of it and how masterfully he put that in a comic routine where people could laugh at it, but as you were laughing, you were going, oh, snap. That's absolutely right, because the, di the dynamic had shifted. Well, I think that he's his brilliance is he can make something about race and until he hits you with the punch, you don't even know that it's about race. Right. Uh, you don't know it's about it. You really, he really brings it in a, in, in such a clever, intelligent way, you know, and, and I'm not knocking comedy or comics, but for the most part, uh, you either were like a clever witty comic or you were a socially conscious comic. Right. Um, he's both and it doesn't miss anything. Um, 
I, I, I could talk about, I, I'm not used to this. Uh, I keep getting out of frame. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I just think I just think he's I think he's so genius that I don't even know how to describe or, or explain what his influence is to me. But if there's any if you would rephrase that question to go, who today would you most admire and want to be be able to be like or influence today? It's him. Right. Exactly. Let me ask you, Grace, let me, let me follow up real quick. Sorry to cut you off. Um, <laughs> Um, we do that all the time. I do a podcast. <laughs> but, um, that being said, um, comedy is going in a lot of different directions. And a lot of times you see a lot of new comics that will come into the game with the Eddie Murphy or the prior and the profanity and the this and the that. And that's for a certain crowd. When you're looking at comedy now and uh, how it's being used, like we just talked about Chappelle and his political influence and, you know, how the message is being taken because his audience is just not a black audience. His audience is across the entire spectrum, whether you love him or hate him. How was it like touring with Ari and what was some of the, with, with his vast knowledge of being in comedy for 30 plus years, what was some of the advice he gave you to put you where you are right now? You know, the, the pearls of the industry, so to speak. Do you want me to give you Aries? Do you want to give me, do you want me to give you the best one that I've ever heard? The best one you ever heard? It was from Earthquake. Do you know, okay. what I know what earthquake is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, earthquake. I, I had. I, I was fortunate enough to get, and it was not early. I was probably five, six years into doing comedy, and I, I was fortunate enough to get to host for him. And uh, he gave me enough time. It was a good show. Um, it was, uh, you know, it, it was. It was in Arizona. It's in Phoenix, so it was mixed audience, but it was primarily a black audience. And I have certain jokes. I grew up, like I said, I grew up. Uh, I grew up a little different. I grew up by the Air Force Base. I grew up in a, a not really a mixed neighborhood, unless you want to uh, make rednecks and uh, part of the mix. Uh, it was, uh, but was, I had like a few. But my next door neighbor, best way I could say is my next door neighbor on my right side of my house was uh, Arnold Hernandez, and uh, on the other side was Chris and Eric Washington, who. Uh, Mexican black dude, so on both sides of me, and then me growing up in the middle. So um, that was kind of culturally that's how I grew up. So I have jokes that kind of fit uh, into trying to explain my place in different cultures. Uh, right. I don't always like to do those jokes in all white room because they a lot of times won't get it or get why it's even if they laugh. I think they laugh sometimes at the wrong part. Right makes any sense uh, okay. and so earthquake heard me do this joke and uh, it didn't go over real well it's a good joke i do it now um solid and uh he goes hey man because he pulled me over he goes that's a good that's a he goes that joke was interesting he goes how often do you do it and i go not very often i only do it if i get like a you know a primarily uh, an urban audience you know uh a lot of mexicans a lot of blacks you know and he goes uh he goes don't do that shit anymore he goes you do that joke for everyone. And then I explained to him why I didn't, because it doesn't make a difference. He goes, you can't find your crowd. The audience, the audience will find you. Maybe it's only one person in that crowd. Maybe it's 10 people in that crowd. Maybe it's a hundred, but they right. will find you. If I go trying to look for them in a crowd of 300 people, I might not find them. I might try to deliver my jokes for what I think they'll want to hear or what it, what I'm anticipating them wanting to hear. And he was like, "No, that's that's completely backwards. You gotta, you gotta do it. Uh, you gotta bring it every night the way that you think you're supposed to do it." And it changed my whole. It, I think it changed my confidence a little bit because my joke did, it didn't go over well. But right. a comedian that I knew was at a level so far above me recognized that there was funny in my joke. And instead of worrying about the audience, I started worrying. And I think this happens to a lot of comedians where you. And it, it, sometimes it can go too far, but when you're trying to uh, get the other comedians to laugh or to see what you're trying to do or to appreciate what you have going on. Right. Um, as far as Aries goes, being on the road with him, he just told me, really open yourself up to, to all the audiences that you're going to get to do. Because you're going to get to do, because Aries has a real mixed crowd. And depending on what city you're in, uh, it changes. But he said, just be prepared and you're going to learn how um, 
what you think is real funny, like when we go to the South, I have a real hard time in the South. I have a hard time in the South. I'm not going to lie. It's uh, really? yeah. <laughs> a real hard time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's the only place I didn't get booed, but in Atlanta, I don't know if, um, if you guys know uh, Atlanta well, but in a comedy club, if they're not enjoying you, they don't boo you. They just start picking up their keys and shaking it like it's time for you to go home. Oh, they, wow. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was doing this. I was doing a set and they wanted me to do a longer set. This room likes to do like really long shows. So he was like doubling my time. And I got into this joke and. I heard some keys start to coming out and then I hit him with a punch and then another punch, the keys went down and I was like, okay, so I survived, but it wasn't, it was, it was a tough week. It was a tough right. week, but wow. that's what makes you a better comic. So I, I embrace all that. Wow. <laughs> keys rattling? I don't know if I can a key rattling. We might have a joke on somebody in the audience for that one. Who keys? You got to go. You got to go. You got, where are you guys going? No, you want me to go? Uh, I ain't going nowhere. You go. <laughs> I was saying that, but I was I'm on Bell Bell Chappelle. Where you I, you were right about one thing. One of the comedy too, I think that also matches. I think we're going to rate your jokes. That's Chris Rock. The no, Chris not Chris Rock, but uh, yeah, Chris Rock. You ever heard of Chris Rock jokes? I don't think he's as funny. We talking about like family situations and stuff. But if you ever heard him tell a racial joke, yeah, it's funny. Hell, I mean, he go to slavery. He go reacting it. I'm talking about. Whoa, I thought Chappelle was the only one could do that. <laughs> I tell you the funniest Chappelle I've seen when he played a black Klansman. I'm sorry, that had to be the funniest set I've ever seen in my life with Chappelle. That he was dead serious with it. <laughs> that, that's a meme right now. On uh, they, they they pulled him uh, out of someone cut it out of the Chappelle show, like a picture of it. And yeah, at the, at the Capitol building, the character that he plays, and, he, and he's standing on top of the Capitol building. Uh, so, yeah, dude, uh, he. He is such a genius. That was a genius piece. Yeah. Unfortunately, even the piece, and and I get, you know, uh, did you see the uh, Mark Twain Award that he won? Yeah. yeah. And he talks about everything that's happened uh, in that. Um, I think it was in that one where he talks about the reason he left was when he was doing the, the pixie joke where he had the two. That was genius. If, it was, if, if what he was saying was that the, there was people who were laughing at it completely incorrectly and he he realized that he wasn't where he wanted to be anymore right but that, but that joke even even that that joke that's what was so amazing he could take it that deep uh he took it so deep that he actually didn't want to be there anymore but i mean good that's how that that that's the that's the genius man well let me ask you about that that and the genius because we saw that he was ridiculed if this is not about Chappelle, this is about you but yeah. we saw in the media that when he left, everybody was like, oh, he left $30 million. And then they demonized him after he left. How could he leave? Oh, he's in South Africa smoking crack, you know, doing all this other stuff because they couldn't grasp. But we see, we, we see that this business, it's a business question. This business of comedy can actually zap your creativity. It can zap your energy. It could zap your, your being, your essence. How do you stay away from that the business part of comedy or the negative part of comedy to where it's just like you know what i'd rather just stay home or get a job at walmart than have to put up with this because I, I i don't care about becoming anything the business is the business i didn't get into it for the business i got into it because i, I love comedy and this is a uh, areas and i talk about this a lot on the road um uh, you know i i don't have a like you asked me about a special mm -hmm. i never Special, I am. I don't care. If I get to do comedy, you know, every week, that's all I care about. If I get to go to a, a club, a bar, if I get to, you know, uh, write comedy, perform, even if I'm not getting paid, just performing comedy. I know you have to get paid. You have to make money. That's what, that's part of this. That's the business part. But that's not how this started for me. And I think the only way you survive this is if you uh, remember. Uh, the reason you, do, you you wanted to do it because obviously there's some people who come into the business and they want to be famous or they want to make a lot of money right but i don't think you i don't think you in any in anything you do in life unless it's a job unless you get a job and you go this is the steps of my job i'm going to become uh my, my girl's a lawyer so i'll use it she she wanted to practice law because people in her family practice law but there's 
but there's also a, a, a ladder of how you build, you know, you start off, you try to become a partner, whatever you do, there, there's, it's, it's, it's not just because it was passion for the law. I mean, some people do. I'm not going to say that. Some people have a direction for that law. A lot of people, it's, it's a job. Yeah. Uh, but if you go into comedy as just a job, there's no path to this. Like, you can take a job as a lawyer. And there's a path to tell you how to get to success. There is no path if you want to do this. Uh, your path has to come from uh, loving what you're doing, experiencing what you're doing, uh, relating to uh, relating what's inside you to people and making it worthwhile to them. And that's how I believe you can you can become successful. But not at, even if you have all those skills, because it is a business and we don't control the business, you may still never get that level that you're looking for. Right. Uh, but I, so when people ask me, I mean, to, to shorten this, because it's a long answer already, the, the shorter way I could say it, uh, people always say, how will you know when you hit, when you're successful? Well, I pay my bills. I'm successful. After right. that, everything else is about a greater success. But I'm doing what I want to do, and I'm paying my bills. Not everybody gets to do what they want to do to pay their bills. So Absolutely. as far as I'm concerned right now, I'm successful. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. That is so true. That's good. You look at that at approach it that way because a lot of people don't see it that way. Now I tell people the best thing you do in life if you enjoy what you do. Exactly. If you enjoy what you do, money doesn't matter to you because you feel the joy of what you do. And some people are not blessed enough to grasp that when they're younger. They don't get to the money 30, maybe 40. If they're lucky, they're 50. They actually reach that plateau. Like I look at um one of my idols, like Samuel Jackson. He started acting very old because he's and acting world, said very, but he loved doing it, and you could tell he strived so fast, so quickly. Versus some person who's been doing it for 30, 40 years, who never got to that plateau where he's at right now, who will probably never ever see the the grass of famous or profit he made from doing what he loved, you mm -hmm. know. And it's, it's sometimes sad, and now people don't have a lot of mentors to do that. Like me, I love playing football, but when it came down to it, I was too short, wasn't tall enough. Wasn't big enough, but I had a heart. You know, right. I love doing it. So, but to say that is like, what inspiration do you use to write your material? Do you mostly influenced by life experiences, or do you just take something around that happened around you, or look at the news? Uh, I hate the news right now, but I'm using the news for a lot of. It. <laughs> how can how could you not use the news right now for, uh, for a lot of for a lot of if you don't. But, you know, but in the in the state of the mentality of people today, taking the news right now sometimes uh, is difficult as well because they came to a comedy show to get away from what's going on on the news. Right, right. Yeah. Sometimes you give that and it doesn't it doesn't go where you want it to go. Even though I think like I have a joke that I thought was was funny and I used it this weekend. Not a great joke, but it was funny. I just thought you know just for a quick, and I'll, I'll say what it is because it was so dumb. I said. Uh, the president of Mexico called Trump and said that he felt he bad about his bad week, so he's going to pay for the wall around the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a little concession on his way out the door. But people didn't really, they didn't respond to it because, you know, they're, they're, they're tight because of everything that's going on anyway. Exactly. And there was a weirdo in the crowd that night, too. So, you, you know, the crowd's also affected by the crowd. And there was just a really creepy dude in there that night who, uh, who looked like he might have been one of the people that rushed the Capitol building. So, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, you know, watch you say to him, man. Oh, hold on. I, mean, I meant to say was, he's a good – I can't say it either. He, no, I can't say it either. <laughs> but I can't, I can't do it. I, can't, I just can't. Because <laughs> I thought he was going to – like, because I went in on him right away. Cause he was, <laughs> so, you know um, – you can't lose the crowd, man. You got to beat the crowd. If the crowd comes at you and you don't stand up, you know you're going to get beat. So I <laughs> at him, and you know it got almost uncomfortable in the room. And then I I tried to get out of that, and I did that joke, and people were just like, I don't know, man. This might not be the right night for that. <laughs> I, I love using things that are around me in the news, but I really get a lot. My my son, uh, my my youngest son is autistic. He's on the autism spectrum, and I talk a lot about raising him because. Um, my experience of raising him is, is you know, it, it's so unique. 
that you get to, that I'm a single, I was a single dad raising an autistic son and I had a lot of help from my older son. Uh, my ex-wife was involved, but more like in a financial way, not in a, not in the upbringing way. Yeah. And, uh, he was, uh, he, he was just, he, he provided me with endless hours of things that I didn't know that were going to end up in my act. And I have like an hour that I do on just him. And, uh, so that's, so because of that, a lot of things from my life go into my set because that's how I learned how to write jokes. Is right. through my son. And so it's all personal. Uh, most everything I tell is a true story. Unless at the very beginning of the show, I'll do some things about the news and a, a few things that I think are funny, but for the most part, most of my, material is about uh things that either happened to me or happened around me through my family or through friends all right so here's the question i know phrase wanted to answer it but i'm gonna take it from i'm gonna excuse me phrase wanted to ask it but i'm gonna take it from him. what's your favorite city my favorite city yeah man your favorite city your favorite room i know atlanta has rooms new york has rooms philly has rooms north carolina has rooms Tucson has the rooms, even though you have a shirt on that says Tucson sucks. I had to. Oh, man, I can't. I, 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 <laughs> all my people in Tucson that know me, grew up with me, you guys got to admit it sucks, man. You got to. <laughs> uh, I have favorite clubs, uh, cities. I, man, I, I like I said, traveling and meeting the people at all, at every, every state that I've been into, all the cities that I've gone to. Man, I just did. There's areas and groups of people that I've enjoyed and uh, have met in all these places. So I enjoy most of all every place that I've traveled. I'm trying to think, uh, though, uh, there's a few places in Ohio that I I don't I'm not a fan of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not crapping on Ohio. Uh, there's just some smaller towns there that haven't embraced me. Uh, but uh, as far as best rooms, man, that DC Improv. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. I think almost every comic will tell you that DC Improv, there's something magical about that room. And then I was fortunate enough to start comedy in Phoenix. And the, and I, and my home room is actually Stand Up Live, which is in downtown Phoenix. But the Tempe Improv, also owned by the same group. Man, that room has been there. That's one of the longest running improvs as well. And I don't know if it's something about uh, comedy that seeps into the walls. Uh, that's a great room as well. Man, those two rooms are probably my two favorite rooms, the Tempe Improv and, and the DC Improv. But, I mean, I went to, uh, there's a new club out in, uh, uh, I think it's, is it the Brickyard uh, in OKC? Man, that club is, it's unbelievable. And it's new. Mm -hmm. and, and usually it takes a, a club, it's like a, it's like a young, like a little person. It takes a while for them to, you know, the audience has to learn to appreciate comedy because if you get a new club in a city, they don't always know there's three, usually there's two or three people on the show. You know, when you pay for a ticket, you think you're going to go see the person you paid for, but you may have two or three people, two, I mean, one or two people before that comic. Right. There's a, there's an uh, audience, you know, you, you kind of develop, like, like going to a football game or a basketball game, the audience, the crowd develops their own personality. And, yeah. You clubs don't have a personality, but this place, man, this one in OKC, Brickyard, I think it's Brickyard, man. That one, it, it's killer, man. That's gonna be, that's gonna be one of my, I think, one of my favorites. <laughs> right, right. Nice, nice. I covered the country pretty good there. I got DC. You pretty much got everybody. Yeah, I got, I got, I got a nice little range there. I see. I got one for you. Now we gonna go back in time a little bit. Uh oh. So. Uh oh. You know, Knowing all the old school common areas, you know, like the Impala, all them places. What place you would love to perform in if you were if you were to transport back in time? Where would you like to perform? Well, the honestly, the it's kind of that one's kind of easy for me because, uh, 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 yeah, and, and it doesn't sound very. It's not as a big deal as it will be to some people when they hear me say it because the Comedy Store. But when it, uh, when Mitzi Shore was alive, mm -hmm. uh, and, like when Richard Pryor was going through there and Robin Williams, I would have liked to have been uh, able to perform. And I'm a very insecure person. I don't always see it, but in my head, I'm like, I'm not funny enough. I'm like, I think people in this industry are that way anyway. And Mitzi to me was like the, the one who could go 
that's that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And I would have liked that. Uh, I would I I feel like I might have had some more confidence if, if she, but she could have looked at me and gone, nah, because there's people she she just wasn't about. So that could have been me too. So, but that that room, I never got to to meet her. I never got to. But she, by the time I got to meet her, she wasn't healthy anymore. Right. She wasn't. Healthy. That room would have been something. But the other room uh, that you said that you started off this with, and you said the Apollo, man, that's still the goal for me. If I could, if I could bring my comedy to a to cross over audiences and be able to do that room. Oh yeah. yeah. Enough said, right? Yeah. yeah. The baby should let Sandman will come out now. It's worse it's the Apollo. He come out of dancing, like, get upstairs, get upstairs, get upstairs. That's, that's embarrassing. <laughs> That's real. You know what I'm saying? That's real. That's better than shaking keys. Well, yeah. the thing is, though, people will watch highlights of people getting taken off stage at the Apollo. That's almost that's what it makes you work. You're not going to go down one time. You're going to go down every time someone clicks that button so they can right. see you get yanked off that stage. And I watch it. I'll go on and I'll watch, like, you know, uh, in, uh, Sandman at the Apollo. You know. Dude, that's not that's not what I wanted. You know that that <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'd be there. I'd be scared of dead to Apollo. Like, wait, hold on. Uh, how I'm gonna do this? Cause uh, I don't want him to come out. I'd be saying, look at the same time. Look at the door. I did. He coming out? What? <laughs> you got him beating you off your game. So, um, being a single father, can you talk to how hard was it to uh, be a dad and also be on the road and some of the challenges that you faced? Uh, that was one of the reasons why I didn't go on the road though right away. It took me a long time to, to, to break out because um, I wanted to stay. I had to stay with my kids, especially True. True's my, my my oldest son is named Maximum Havoc, and my youngest dude is True Chaos. Those are my two boys, and uh, yeah, that's the real names. And uh, True really, I didn't want to just you know leave him, but as he, as he got older and my other son had graduated. Um, and he was able to help me out a little bit. Uh, that worked out well. My so if I could go on the road for a weekend, but I, when I would go on the road, I would only go maybe like once every couple months. Uh, then when True finally was old enough, that's when I got to go. So I wouldn't. I don't want to say it was hard. It was. It was a thoughtful process. I had to be, you know, uh, aware of my situation, and it, it it may have slowed me down even more from going from doing more gigs that I would have liked to have done. But you know, I uh, he didn't ask to come into this world, uh, so mm -hmm. I, had, I, my, I I tell the story that my dad didn't raise me; he took off when I was one, and so I wanted to be there for my kids. And I always tell people, don't feel bad for me though; he caught up again with me when I was in my thirties. But life has a way of messing with you. And one day he was just gone; he didn't die or nothing. He just yeah. called and come over, which is worse because it's like he looked at me in thirty and went, "Nah, my first decision was the right decision." Oh so, wow! Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wanted to be there for my dudes more than anything. I wasn't going to raise them the way I was raised. Uh, but you know what? All that said, my kids don't have any more confidence than I have, and we still all have our same challenges. But I was there at least. I can feel good about that. That's true. Right. That is right, true. Right, right, right. That is true. So let me ask you a question, though. Now, some of the old great comedians, like say, like um, John Candy, um, quite a few other ones, that they had a lot of issues that meant they, personal issues also – Laid into their actually, I would say careers where someone went good route, someone went bad route. Like, what were some of the things that kept you from going to say alcohol or drugs or something, despite all the bad things going up and down for you? I did it all when I was younger. I did all that bullshit when I was younger. Uh, uh, I, I went through that one in the eighties, and uh, I was done. And when I got to, yeah, when I got out of the eighties, basically after the eighties. With all that stuff, so. and I, I, I had my uh, my time, and I'm not going to say I was a good kid. I wasn't um, <laughs> at all. I got in trouble for weed. Um, the weed wasn't my drug of choice, but weed made me money to get my drug of choice, which was right. uh, I'll be honest, I, I talked about this before. It was coke, man. I love, uh, I love, I loved it, man. Uh, but you know, when you're when you're in your twenties. Sometimes you make bad decisions. I made a bunch of bad decisions. So again, even though I did, I got such a late start. I mean, people told me, you know, maybe that's why. Because if 
I would have done it younger and things would have worked out, I might not be here to answer that question you just asked me. Right. That's true. Right. So sometimes, sometimes things work out for a reason. Right. That is true. That is so true. With, so with COVID, how are you adjusting? I know everybody has gone to the internet. I know Cassidy, DJ Cassidy is doing concerts on the internet. Um, you know, you have musicians that are doing concerts on the internet. Um, but you don't see that many comic, comics, excuse me, doing sets, you know, on YouTube or on their Instagram. Um, why do you think that is, or do you think that they feel they actually need a live audience to understand the, the, the impact of their joke? It's, it, I can tell you from my experience, I've done a few and I hate them. I won't do them. Um, first of all, I'm not a social media guy. I mean, I had to ask you, I called you yesterday. Guys, how do I do this? I want to make sure I know how to do what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, just, I, I'm not that guy. I'm not a social media guy. I, I have an Instagram. Sometimes I'll be on, I'll be on Instagram for a week, like a solid week. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And then it just fades away. Um, I try. But it, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm older. It, it isn't from, but I, I can't use that excuse because even the older comics have caught up to that. And they, they're, they're doing it because that's how you stay on top. Uh, but to, speaking of the, directly to the audience online, man, if you can't hear that laughter, if you can't get that energy, uh, I don't know. What, I don't know how to do that. And then they did. Uh, I know they've been doing like uh, driving, uh, drive in movie theater shows. Right. Have, you're on the back of a truck. And uh, they have you standing up, and everybody has the you know can hear you on the radio because uh, it's broadcasted in, in, into the radio, so they can hear you, but you can't hear any laughter. So right. people are honking their horns and flashing their lights, but when you're on stage, the last thing you want to hear is horns honking and people <laughs> flashing their lights. So right. to me, it's like I'd rather just not do it. I'd rather write, and I've been lazy about writing too because I, I there's nowhere to really there's been, hasn't been as many opportunities to perform it. Um, when uh, lately we've been getting to go out on the road a little bit more, so uh, I'm, I'm starting to write a little bit more. But uh, man, I I'm just gonna do. I no, I don't think anybody's gonna blow up, and I shouldn't say this. Blow up. Okay, yeah, I will say it. I'm not gonna blow up from doing shows. I don't think I'm gonna blow up from doing shows on the internet live right now. Right. And uh, I do this for the love of comedy, and I don't love doing it that way. Uh, right. There's and the other thing is most comics are narcissists. I mean, we need, uh, we're insecure, but we love ourselves. So we need you to go to that audience and give us immediate uh, validation. That we're and that's, uh, I talk about that on stage too, uh, that I need that. Uh, so uh, COVID has been tough. And that's one of the jokes that I've been telling is that uh, that all fell to my girlfriend. She had to love me more. She has to be more, you know, cause I'm looking for a replace about, a thousand people a weekend telling me I'm good. Right. So uh, she needs. Sometimes she just needs to tell. Me, I, I need to tell me I'm good more more than she has before. I, so it's her job right now. <laughs> <laughs> so She's speaking like, of COVID, speaking of COVID, Fred, he always want to have jokes. Man, let the comedian be. Funny. I ain't said nothing. He said it. He said the wife. I ain't said nothing. I'm pacing myself. You guys tell jokes, man. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you feel about the state of the economy and everything today? Because of COVID or are we going to be everything? Everything. COVID, everything. You know, you're in Arizona. Fraser's in Miami. I'm in New Jersey. So I need I'm to get a call. I'm in Jersey City. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, oh didn't know. Yeah, I, uh, I was in Harrison. I was in, I, when I moved out to, uh, to Jersey, I moved to Harrison. Um, do, you know, do you know that area at all? Yeah. Harrison, York. It just the Harrison area doesn't have like uh there's nowhere to eat. There's no restaurant. There's no like you know. There's very little in that area. So uh, when our lease ended, we moved to Jersey City because there was a lot of stuff. And especially after COVID, there's things that are open out here. So we right. start going out here. Uh, I left Arizona about a year and about six months before COVID. So that was the biggest adjustment to COVID was uh, having to. Uh, Go from having a house I could go outside. Uh, I had like a townhouse, so I had a patio. But you know, we had a pool in the complex, and then coming out here, and I was basically locked up in you know about six hundred square feet. And so uh, you know, we had one bedroom, and then she had to work from home too. So she's an attorney, so I had to be quiet. <laughs> 
I got sent to my room all the time. And I like to be, I need that, like I said, I need that attention. So I'm playing jokes on her. And uh, so when we moved, we got a two bedroom so she can shut the door and that this became, I'm in the office right now. So this door gets shut during the daytime and uh, I'm not really supposed to come in. And I have to knock, and, you know, she, she has to go off. so I, I mean, I'm trying to respect that, uh, that area, you know, being a real job. Uh, but with COVID, the situation, I, I mean, I like COVID, I like, <laughs> I like COVID better than the president. So, uh, <laughs> I think the president is in the position right now to take out more people than COVID has. So, um, yeah, that I, I, I never said that before, but I think that could sum it up right there. Um, no, I mean, no doubt. I, I definitely agree. I don't think, I think he's 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 our show. you know, I kind of agree with you a little bit. I think he's very, very dangerous and always has been a dangerous individual, you know, and um, it's just hard. You know, because like I say, a lot of times we wake up in this skin every day. So what we have to deal with is a little bit challenging with some other people, you know, who can just look at that and go, oh, well, it really can't be that bad. You know, like I've always said, you know, thank God for cell phones and videos, because now the whole world can see it and they go, oh, wait, maybe they were onto something or maybe they were telling the truth that it could be that bad. Well, um, if there's one thing that I'll give Trump like a. Give him, I don't even know how you give this to him, but I'll give it to him this way. Um, he's he's done more to show everybody what you're saying is true. He's done more to bring out people to 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 uh, instigate enough that you have to look at it and go. I mean, when you look at the Capitol building and, uh, you know, well, I don't know, you, but I've been, I watch the news all day because it's part of you know, that. <laughs> and I, I, I tell Tara when she's, my girl's name is Tara. So when she's uh, when I'm watching TV, like I watch a lot of TV shows. Aries and I talk. We I have my own podcast with Aries Spears. We talk about uh, everything from movies to politics to music, whatever. And so she'll go, "You watch? How many movies have you watched today?" I go, "It's work. You know, I'm working." I'm working. <laughs> but <coughs> excuse me, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, he's he's he like. When I'm looking at the Capitol and on what they said on the news today was that they didn't uh, – <coughs> the reason the National Guard wasn't out, they didn't want that look on the staff. Yeah, of the military forces uh, yeah. being civilian, but they didn't mind that look for Black Lives Matter. Yeah, go take it back. I'm old. Take it back. Farrakhan's Million Man March. Yeah. Uh, they had it then. So um, – and, and – so we can we can take this. I mean, obviously, the further back we can go, we can give more examples, but with less film. Exactly. So as we go forward, though, this really framed it. And I and I'm watching TV, and, and they're still not like CNN, who thinks that they know what they're talking about. They're still not getting it quite right. Uh, not even close. I'm not. I'm gonna say not even close to quite right. They're not getting it right. Exactly. And they could frame this conversation even better because. Uh, on our pod, on the podcast that I do with Aries, we talked about it. Uh, it comes out, it come, it comes out Wednesday. But I, I said, um, and Aries and I talked. We talk really hard about. It. We're, we're honest. Um, I, I said, uh, take take away uh, the politics from it. Take away. You, you take the politics out. You could say that those guys uh, were there to protest for whatever reason you want to say it, and make that about that. But now, uh, and, and let's 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 assume. Um, none of them were racist. Let's assume that. Let's assume none of them were racist. They were all protesting the election that was stolen from Donald Trump. Let's say that. But then when you look at the force that was that we'll use, if it's black folks, and it doesn't even have to be black folks. It has to have a black imp uh, impression. Black Lives Matter, there was a lot of white people, Mexican, but there was a lot of people yes. marching beside black people. Absolutely. Black Thank people. you for saying that. Thank you for saying that because a lot of people only believe that black folks were doing it. Thank you for saying that. Dude, yeah. uh, not not to not to pat myself on the back, but I, I I went on marches here in New Jersey. We went up to the cap. We went up to the uh, whatever capital uh, in New York. We we uh, and and I was surprised because I, and I was surprised in a good way. It was it, you know when a white dude says this, it just it, it sounds kind of corny to me. But I, I was I was surprised at the diversity, and I was actually proud of my country not of me or the people around me that right. had this and the people in this country came out 
because when I talk about George Floyd, I don't say George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. He was killed in everyone's living room. That's right. Exactly. So if it, you know, if you saw someone get killed in your house, you would go out and protest it. So we did, and that made me happy or proud of uh, of the people of the country to, to come out and do that, or at least the people that were out there. I was proud of them. Um, but uh, I even forgot where I'm, I, I could get real passionate about this, so I don't even know what we were talking about other than. Uh, we're passionate, holy yeah, yeah. passionate. Yes, we've talked about exactly. this. We talked about it, well, not at nauseum, but the thing is, like I was just telling Frage before we came on, Andy, is the fact that I dread looking at my phone because every day it's it's even worse than got you. You know, I have two kids, a 13-year-old and a nine-year-old, and I am literally like, and I live in a Republican district. I don't know if you know where Jackson, New Jersey is. Yeah, I do. I live there. Yeah, I live in Jackson, New Jersey, right around the corner from Six Flags. Now, I used to live in Irvington, New Jersey, next to Newark. So imagine the shock of from that to this. You see what I mean? Yeah, that's a whole different. I'm from Arizona, so I get it. You know, and then having to sit here and now answer questions of a nine-year-old about Trump. And I'm like, well, where are you getting that? And then answer questions from a 13-year-old. Oh, they said this about Trump. Where are you getting that? And then I still have to be mindful of the people driving with the flags on their trucks and the Trump sign as if they're more American than me. You know what I mean? And the people throwing garbage on my lawn because we're one of the only black families on the street. You know, and I have to sit there and deal with all that and navigate that. So it's we, we can talk about this particular topic and other things. For the next four hours, if we chose, because it's real. <laughs> I mean, it's real for me, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I, don't, I don't, I don't minimalize that, um, but it actually is, you know. It's like almost walking on eggshells down here. Don't know how to step. Don't know what to say. Don't know what shirt to wear. You know what I mean? Like it's crazy. Yeah, that's true. But here's my problem. That, that, that it's bothering me because you talked about where you're from in Jackson or living in Jackson. Dude, uh, when you see this, and like I said, and this is what we were talking about, framing that conversation, everything you could say, like I just said before, they were there to protest. They weren't racist. But when you take the picture of it and go, how were they treated? How were they treated? Why were they treated this way? Why wasn't there any military presence? When they broke in, uh, why wasn't there? What, what was to stop them? And when they were, they were there's this, um, there's a stupid joke. It's, it's a Seinfeld joke. And he did it on the TV show. It wasn't even part of the set. He said, uh, what I don't understand is when I go to the post office, they have all those pictures of the most wanted people. Why didn't they just keep them when they took the picture? That was a dumb joke. <laughs> <up. laughs> right. But my, my point is when I'm watching this thing on TV that we need help identifying these people, you had them. They were right there. Right. How did you let, how did you walk these, far? and I watched them walk these guys out of the building. Right. And what it comes down to is that white people can't see themselves as evil or bad. And that's, you know, that's the bottom line. But when we, now we have a video to show you even the thought process and you live in a place where you feel uh, that you are being sought out as something different and maybe something that is undesirable for that neighborhood to them. But we just showed that they showed themselves who they are. Right. So how, how can this continue? This is my, uh, this is, this is, I, and I, this is, uh, this is where, you know, like I said, I'm in the, you're in your, you said you're in my, you live in that skin. I live in this skin. I'm embarrassed and I should be. Aries was doing, saying something because not all white people, stop saying not all white people because now it represents, if black people had to be represented by every walk of black life, now white people have to be represented by every walk of, black, of white life. Right. So stop separating us. That re that represents me just as well. And until until we take responsibility for our representation, it, it's, it, it won't change. But this is what I said when I initially started this conversation. I get this is the only thing I can give to Trump. He put it out there in a way that we all saw it, whether it was intentional or obviously it wasn't unintentional for that to happen. Mm -hmm. But it happened. Right. So. Uh, if that's what it took to get to this place, and I, I heard you say, you know, you're, you're not looking at the news or you know feeling uncomfortable with, it. I'm not, man, because I believe I, this is where this is where uh, anybody who's listened to me and who's agreed with me now will disagree with me. I believe in this country. 
Yeah. I, I know it wasn't. Set, I know that it wasn't set up for black people to come in this country. I know what it was set up. I know what it was set up for for black people in this country. But if you read that Constitution, just the Constitution, not the amendments, not anything that came after it, just that they were smart enough to say all men were created equal, which to women wasn't isn't going to be that smart. But they were smart enough to say in that room they. I give them because there was there was uh, founding fathers in that room who didn't own slaves, who were against slavery in that right. room. Right. And their voice was strong enough in that room that it, th let's not lie about it. You know that there's somebody in that room said, no, nah, it's not all, all men. It's all white men. It's all white landholder men. But for whatever reason, the voices in that room got to say all men are created equal. And from that point on, if it didn't have that, if it didn't have that, we could tear it up and throw it away, but it has that. And then we have three branches of government. And we're finding out right now, this is why I like the news. I'm finding out right now, is any one of those branches stronger than the other? Because this president hasn't been able to take over. He hasn't been able to run a coup. He hasn't been able to do anything. Uh, he's been able to do a lot, but he hasn't been able to take over. And as long as we have that peaceful transition of power and we move on to the next president, who I don't think is going to be a whole lot better, except that he speaks better and he has uh, he's a more staff. I don't want to say a savvier speaker. I think I think the fact that he sat next to Obama for eight years, uh, he might have absorbed some. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't start out that way, is what I'm saying. I hope oh, yeah, and absolutely. By osmosis. osmosis. I hope he got some. Uh, uh, I hope, though, uh, when that takes over and they do what's next, whatever, whatever they want to follow up with. I don't want I don't want to impeach because it's it's going to it won't happen until after he's out of office. If you impeach him, uh, there's a chance that uh, if, if you do it before he's out of office, there's still a chance that he, he they get pardoned from uh, Pence. Uh, I don't want him to, if he does try to pardon himself. I know that that could be invalidated. I know we could go to court for that. Um, I, I think he should be censured, and I think they should go after him uh, for his for crimes. That's what I would like to see happen. Uh, uh, and if you want to bring the country together with all this, like bring the country together, and heal, here is the easiest thing that I think you could do. They, they're complaining about the, the election was stolen, and uh, so I would have I would if I was Biden, I would launch an investigation, transparent investigation into voting here in America. But by right. doing that, I would do was what this widespread voter fraud that he's talking about we can look into that but then let's also look at voter suppression since right. we're going to put that on the table let's look at voting as a whole and let's really see what's happening with voting and if we look at voter suppression we're going to find out some interesting things there as well so let's put that on the table and in that and then look at criminal offense offenses for the insurrection and and it should be and i and i don't have a problem this is what <laughs> not mad. I'm not mad at the congressman who wanted to invalidate those votes. I'm really not. And the reason I'm not is because some of the some of the uh, states that they wanted to invalidate is because in the state's constitution, they were supposed to have uh, the legislator was supposed to pass the the, the, the new voting rules because of uh, uh, with mail in ballots or whatever, and they couldn't do that because of COVID. And so they, uh, I think, the secretary of the state did it instead. So they they have a legal ground to do it, and by by law they have the right to do that. I'm not going to hold them, but Rudy Giuliani, that other dude who spoke on the steps with Trump, I don't know who he is. All those guys who incited those people to come, that's a problem. They should be investigated. And then the bigger investigation is, and this happened today. I don't know if you watched the news today. They just uh, uh, fire, fired two of the uh, uh, Capitol uh, officers. No, I didn't see that. Yeah. They fired two because they let them into the building. There, there's rumor now that's coming out. This is possibly uh, this was a plan, uh, a, a plan to do this. Because let's face facts: a lot of the guys that went in there were just some dumbasses that were carrying the, the podium around. They followed those people, but there's people that were running around with the cuffs and that stuff. They came in there with the purpose. They had an agenda. Uh, yeah. Those people all need to go. That's treasonous, and right. and. and to take this up to one last level, and I know that I'm, I'm talking a lot, and I know you're passionate on this because I can see your face. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> enjoying it, trust me. I am. I if, definitely if you am. Take treason all the way to Trump, 
and this is where I'm going to get in trouble for what I'm about to say. Uh -oh. You can take it to treason all the way to Trump or Rudy Giuliani or any of those guys, uh, the guys that uh, may have pre-planned it that they can find out. I wish they could do an old school way where you just take him out onto the White House lawn and uh, you finish that right there. You, you found guilty and you're done. You know, I really, Andy, you know I, I, I'm interjecting right now is because I told my wife that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. During Lincoln's time, yep. there was a, a, a military court and a tribunal. And once you were found guilty, you didn't go to jail. They had the gallows waiting for you and they yeah. hung you right there exactly. on the ground. You know what I mean? And I know now we're more civilized, quote unquote, but we, we don't do that anymore as far really? as. I don't think we're more civilized either, though. I don't think we're more civilized. The moment, it's still, it's still in the Constitution. It's still there. The treaty is punishable by death. It's still there. They were taking it out. And it's still I, there. But it's but it there. It's until judgmental. They let people decide what how they want to punish them, either uh, life in prison. Or actually going in front of death, or to buy death. But I think, truthfully, like I'm gonna go back to what you said, Andy. I'm gonna go back to what you said, George. It's like old school. Yeah. Take, put some fear in them because if you don't do it now, like one lady, one on news, lady, one lady said, if we don't stop it now, who say it goes further next time? Right. Who actually try to take over the whole entire country next time? If right. you don't stop it now, put a nip in the bud right now. Um. Yeah. I I, I really believe. All this that we're saying. The reason I like old school is because when you hear a beat from old school days, don't you feel you feel better about that beat? Yeah. It's good. We need to feel good. We need to fix this cancerous uh, uh, idea of what our country. This is not what our country was supposed to supposed to be. Supposed to be the uh, he has breached. And the thing about Trump is, listen, I never thought, I never thought that he would do what he's doing. I right. thought he would do an economic policy and he would be. Good at that. I never thought he'd bring out what he's brought out. I'm, and I'm, but this is where it gets weird for me. I'm not unhappy that he did it. I'd rather him bring it out than pretend that we were in a different uh, place in America than we were. Right. Right. So, in, in some ways, I'm, um, I'm just. Let's put it this way. I'm disappointed, but I'm happy it's out on, out on the uh, happy it's out where we can see it, and it, it has to be seen. Right. And, it can't be denied any longer. Right. Uh, but I, I, I'm really still happy or proud of the of the government, the three part, the three systems of our government that are independent branches of our government that work with each other, but not again for each other. Um, I really think that we we can survive this. And like you said, we need just to, but we need there has to be some consequences for what's happened. I agree. Definitely agree. And that's what that's what I'm worried about. And th they're not going to be the consequences. Well, there will. But we have to hold it there. Can we tell everybody where um, you can find you on social media, even though you're I'm, off? And yeah. And I'm a comic. And we just had a conversation that had nothing to do with comedy whatsoever. <laughs> the comedy conversation ever. Uh, you can find me on social media at uh, Andy Comedy on Instagram. And uh, I think it's Andy Steinberg or Andy Comedy, both, I think, on Facebook. And I do Twitter, but not that often. I usually own Instagram is the best way to find me if anybody would even want to find me. Um, and uh, I also do a podcast with Ari Spears, and that is uh, Spearsburg Pod on all social media platforms. You can find it on Instagram and Twitter, all those. Um, and our, po our podcast is called Spears and Steinberg. It comes out every Wednesday and Thursday. And I will be at the Tempe Improv this weekend. Uh, I'm actually opening, not for Aries, but for uh, Greg Fitzsimmons, who's okay. an interesting comic. And I'll be back with Aries in San Antonio, LOL, the following week. Nice. Nice. That's all, that was the most professional I've ever been. Nice. <laughs> well, listen, man, we definitely want to thank you for being on the show and having real talk and conversation from comedy and politics. We would definitely I love it. I hope I didn't stray too far off the road. Oh. Oh, no. You know, we actually needed those kind of conversations because whenever me and Frage talk about it, they just be like, oh, they talking. So we need new faces and we need new voices. So we're going to be coming on the show. Well, hopefully I can make some of this shit funny for the people who come out there. <laughs> uh, but they, they, it'll, it'll be funnier if we make improvements and as it goes along. Uh, Absolutely. But we'll make it funny eventually.
Absolutely. Well, we greatly yeah. appreciate you being on the show. Thank you, man. Gotta have you back, man. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> man, great right, show. So, it was. <laughs> You know, I mean, we need those kind of have those kind of shows and have those kind of conversations. Check out tomorrow's show, ladies and gentlemen. We have MMA. What is it? MMA champion. MMA Titan champion. FC champion. Yes, Titan FC champion will be with us. Uh, uh, Ralph, I believe his name is. Ralph Masolo. Masolo. Yeah. Good. We'll yeah, Brazilian. Listen, check this out. Tomorrow it's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you want to catch the show live, check us out tomorrow on East Coast Time. All right. Hey, this is George. Hey, this is Fraser. And that was Real Talk with George and Fraser. Peace. Peace.